I'm Cher Stallings. I'm an executive at Universal 1440 Entertainment. And uh, we found at one point that uh, we could do a sequel to 47 Ronin. And that's what we're doing. My thought at the time was that it would be fun to really um, create a modern samurai story and um, pretend that the samurai still exist, that they just went underground. Mm -hmm. Sort of um, that this world kind of like Kingsman exists that we don't know about. As far as the main construct of, of the script, I wanted to change the original script more so into a chase journey, where before it was kind of like paint by numbers, scene by scene, that kind of stuff. I wanted our heroes to kind of feel like they were always, like they had to look over their shoulder and, and, and just be on the run and stuff to create this kind of frenetic energy. Um, and for me, it's, it was also incorporating kind of a new culture of samurai. So three, four hundred years later, I want to envision more of a POC kind of vibe so that we can incorporate all, you know, all types of our brothers and sisters in this film. And so, as you know, every director has um, their own unique way of <laughs> you know, uh, working with a cinematographer. I mean, yes, he gives a, a general directions. We'll talk about the scenes, you know, we'll talk about how, you know, the feeling, how he wants it to go. And then, but he does give a lot of freedom, you know, how you want to shoot it. And then uh, um, there's one thing that he loved most is doing uh, two steady cam at the same time, you know, which <laughs> in the beginning, of course, you can see, you know, as you have two camera moving at the same time, we either run into each other or hitting each other. But after a while, we kind of get a hang of it. And then, yeah, it's been working out pretty good. <laughs> uh, we got uh, one of the, the best guys in, in Budapest, uh, Gecko, uh, as our, our lighting gaffer. And then uh, just they just integrate everything together and does amazingly. And uh, of course, our production designer uh, Joseph, that um, the things that he puts out it just make our life much easier, so much easier. Marta Costco's Shin Hi, Anna Akana. I'm playing Luna. Hi, I'm Teresa Tan playing Onami. Mike Mo playing Rio. Hi, I'm Chikaku Kukuyama. I'm playing Aya. Um, Well, we were so lucky <laughs> to have our director who has all these relationships. We had some great actresses, like people, I'm really proud of, of the Asian and the POC community and the, and the Latinas uh, that came in and auditioned because there was a lot of great work. Um, you know, Anna Akana came in originally reading for Onami and I had an eye on someone else for Onami and I, it was just like, for me, I was like, wow, she's, she actually would be a great Luna. And like, and for me, casting and all the executives, they, they were like, yeah, because she crushed it. One. So my character Luna is actually half Japanese and half Latina. She's kind of got uh, a chip on her shoulder, she's been to jail before. She's just very cool, very edgy, very aloof, has a lot of daddy issues and generational trauma that she's carrying, but she's never been to therapy, no doubt. 
Uh, Luna's very, very kind and very generous, but she's not incredibly trusting. She's super guarded based on her upbringing. She never knew her dad who abandoned her in the States. Her mom passed away. And so she's kind of like this orphan navigating through the world with really no close relationships. Originally, the character of Luna um, was called Mason. It was actually kind of a male, and it was originally Caucasian. But I think when I first came in to pitch uh, uh, to Universal 1440, I was just thinking, you know, I think it would be interesting if we could change this either into kind of like an Asian or mixed Asian, Latina, Asian kind of character that isn't truly know about her history. So. Um, so for me, what was great was that Universal was very receptive about it. it was, they, they were actually really receptive to a lot of ideas I was you know, trying to put out there. I think I'm similar to Luna in the ways that we use humor as a, a coping mechanism and a defense mechanism. Like if I can make fun of myself faster than other people can make fun of me, then nobody can hurt me because I've already said it first. And it's sort of using wit and humor as a wall to your vulnerability. I also think Luna, once you know, people get past that, that guarded wall and into her circle of trust, she is willing to do anything for them. She reminds me of sort of like, she's your pit bull, you know? She's like sweet and she's cuddly when she loves you and you're her person, but if anyone fucks with you, she's gonna fuck you up. And I find those commonalities, like that loyalty and that earned trust and that generosity to sort of be where we overlap. Hello. So during the pandemic, um, Ron Yuan, our fantastic director, actually reached out to me. And uh, it was during the time where I'm like, oh my God, there's no hope in the world and I'm never gonna work again. And um, it was before he was even attached to the project and he had thought of me for um, the role of an Onami. And I was like, damn, that sounds freaking amazing. You know, two years later, you know, uh, finally went through the audition process, fought for my role, and here I am. So, you're leaving me in charge? Onami is a badass motherfucker who is extremely disciplined and loyal to her clan, especially to her lord, Lord Chinchiro, played by the amazing Mark Coscos. Uncle. Um, and she is basically a diamond in the rough who um, is not afraid to speak her mind and throughout her journey she finds her own voice and purpose. What are we doing today guys? We are um, all in this together, <laughs> yes. and you know that we're gonna slice ninjas up here. Hi everyone, thanks for thanks for being a fan of 47, uh, Blade of the 47. Well, um, you know, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, my big bro Ron for many, many years, and um, it just so happens that the fates aligned on this one, and I was happy uh, to be to get the call from Big Bro. So uh, yeah, it's been great. It's, uh, it's, it's one thing to work on something that's fun and exciting and something that, that you're passionate about as far as storytelling, but when you can do it with friends and family, and we've really become a family in this last nine weeks, uh, it just makes it all that much more fun. Rio is, um, you know, I find a few things about every character I play, and with Rio, I find that rebellious kind of snarky, smart ass, but also kind of a, a hero that, you know, knows when to take a step back, knows when it's his time to assert himself. But in this movie, I think it's really cool that I know when to kind of let other people shine, and that's and that's really special about his character. Oh, Magic Mike in the house! Oh my God! <laughs> Action. 
Lord Shinshiro, samurai clan leader, and he certainly has a strong sensibility of tradition and honor, and he loves his family, and he's really good at the sword. So I, I knew that Ron, with his sensibility <clears throat> and his superb acting chops, plus his hand-picked crew and uh, all that, you know, he was he was going to he was going to give us a really good shot at doing something good, and that's really hard because you know it requires a good script first of all, and then there are so many ways of messing up a movie, so you need as much support as possible, and I knew that Ron was going to bring that. So between uh, Lord Shinshiro's sensibility and his wisdom and the relationship dynamics between his clan members, his students, his apprentices, and the other lords, there was everything to like. That's what drew me to this character. And you have boom, shh, shh, boom, slow mo. And action. <laughs> my character, my character is Lord Nico, which is, uh, I think it's the first time I play a lord. And <laughs> Uh, so essentially we have in the story, you know, without giving a lot of it away, it's essentially uh, 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 about five clans of samurai through the years, of course, and so the samurai present day or, or contemporary, you know, they, they still are there, but they sort of assimilated themselves into, into the world. And, and the five clans have different personality, uh, personalities, different beliefs, and Lord Nico leads um, his clan and uh, sort of like the rebel in, in a sense, you know, Nico is, is very arrogant and, and I think, you know, the other word is uh, in the script they described him as insufferable and, um, uh, but he's a samurai, but he, he happens to believe that the samurai should, should evolve and adapt to, to the times instead of sort of staying with the tradition and some of the uh, uh, legends and beliefs that he feels is very antiquated. So he's very modern. He, be he even believes in using uh, uh, modern weaponry, guns and, and things like that. So it's not just about the sword. And, um, and that's not, you know, it, it's not received well by re the rest of the clan. And it doesn't help that he's very arrogant and, and very passionate about his cause, but, he, but he's, um, his bed, bedside manners can be improved a bit. <laughs> Snatch your heart out your chest till every lung turns cold. Immortal breast dealers slicing through the enemy. Poison with no remedy to you reside in hell eternity with no amenities. Hi. I played Aya. Uh, she's one of the honorable geisha, and she's strong, she's genius, she has a responsibility, and she has absolute love and trust in other sisters in Lord Shinshiro. I played Mai. She's the most motherly figure among three honorable geisha, and also has a traditional quality. So usually, so when Onabugeishas are mistreated, she just takes in and resolve within her. So she wouldn't speak up, uh, especially towards lords. I love seeing the Onabugeisha represented in the film because they all look so badass. And seeing the women, you know, in these amazing fashionable outfits, beautiful makeup, kick ass with swords and like murder fools left and right. I was like, wow, I don't think I've ever seen this as a kid, you know? 
you had Lucy Liu, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, uh, Mowgli from The Jungle Book, the yellow Power Ranger, and that was fucking it in the 90s. And so I was like, I was very excited for all the little Asian girls who are gonna watch this, uh, even though it's rated R, they'll, they'll still find a way. And be very inspired by the badassery and the female empowerment and seeing just women get to be deadly fucking assassins. Throughout Japanese history, it's, you know, not a lot of people know that there were these great female samurai, you know, it started off them being the last line protection for the emperor as far as like whether it was like concubines, that kind of stuff, but they would, they would have the knowledge of the arts to defend and, and fight to the death, but then later on they actually became integrated into the military. So you had great, you know, famous female generals. So the Onobu Geisha, I really thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to bring them in. So in the film, they're not ex really acknowledged. But by the end of the film, you know, hopefully you guys are watching this after you watch the film, so I'm not giving anything away. Uh, they, they do have their place again in, in history. So this is Yoshi Sadaso. What's up? In his natural habitat, <laughs> doing things that we usually see him doing. Yeah. If you haven't seen his yeah. Instagram, this is, you're seeing it now. Arai is somebody that uh, he's lived his life uh, for duty, for what he believes in, and uh, for, for his destiny as one of the last remaining uh, of the 47 Ronin. And so um, I think he's very much of that samurai culture. He's a strong character, uh, and he embodies everything that we would expect from the hero of the film. Someone that comes in strong, uh, has that intense sort of presence, has that martial arts ability uh, and the honor. Uh, but then it's kind of a red herring. Uh, can we, is this, you said I can give away? Yeah. I'm giving away, I'm giving away. He's not the hero of the film, because he dies. But we set him up to be that way and then uh, obviously that paves the way for the rest of the film to happen and we discover our new heroes in, in the characters that we meet later on that don't necessarily embody that same energy, but have to learn to find it. And so that's, that's the journey. Yeah. Oh, he's lifting me up, oh my gosh, he's so strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's not, see, cause movie magic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. 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 I'm nervous. <laughs> because there are people in the background. <laughs> No, it's fine. You guys can be there. It's fine. Yes, Dash. He's very selfless. He's dedicated. He's energetic. Uh, uh, in my mind, the imagery that st stuck with me is um, the monk that died from self-immolation and his inner inner. Like he, he wants something stable. He wants peace and he's quite attuned to other people's pain. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of, yeah, like a rough, rough, yeah. So selfless, dedicated, energetic. Edina. Soroshan, Soroshan, Soroshan. Um, I primarily play villains these days, so like I've always said, villains are very fun to play. Um, there's a lot of sort of leverage uh, that you get that's afforded to you when you get a chance to play those characters. I can only say that when somebody is impassioned to a degree that they're willing to sacrifice so much that as it starts to extend beyond their own realms and it starts to affect other people, that's obviously a flaw. And what's, what's interesting about that is that we in this culture, especially in this society, um, value hard work and dedication and um, <clears throat> to the point that it becomes, uh, it can be ruthless, right, in the pursuit of doing whatever you need to do to succeed and sacrificing so much. But what's interesting about that is that's also a flaw. And that's inherent in, I think, all villains, all characters that are classified as villains.
James and Zach, those guys, they worked. I would have to say they worked so hard. Um, I don't know how many fights they had to come up with. I don't know how many hours they had to work. I know if, as actors, we came in in the prep period. We did like four hours of training, you know, and those guys were there eight, nine, ten hours every day. So when I was complaining about, oh, I'm tired, it's just like you put it into perspective, those guys put in a lot of work. Uh, Ron brought in uh, Alfred, who is, uh, is a certified um, master of the, of, the, of the sword. So we, you know, certainly me and, and a lot of us will put through the sort of the training period to really learn the basics of, uh, of how to handle the samurai sword correctly and of course so slowly work our way up to uh, the choreography and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's very different from anything that I've done. And it didn't matter if it was someone who was super experienced like Mark DeCasco, who's been on millions of these films, he was offering advice to the new guys, to me, and you know, he was always there helping us out. And then we had, we had our trainers, Dan was there. He was, you know, even though he's, he's, a, he's the villain in the film, you know, he's acting in the film. He was still had time to answer questions. Ron was always around and everyone's just so experienced. Everyone was just so gung-ho about it that it, it was two weeks of training, but it just went by like that. Yeah, it was so much fun. Like we'd spend majority of the day just at this amazing gym called AAA, which used to be an auto shop, <laughs> but it's amazing. Um, I had, you know, such great choreographers, Zach, James, shout out. Jimmy, who helped me with all these things that we didn't actually get to do, but they were still fun. <laughs> Being immersed, surrounded by, you know, these great castmates who are also so well-versed in martial arts. And, you know, it makes me feel like, oh, shit, I gotta get my shit together, you know? Last take, I felt like yeah! I couldn't feel my landing and I kind of just jammed my left knee into the ground and I basically heard this crack when I landed. And I was like, oh no, this is over. Before I was able to, you know, go to the hospital and get checked out, you know, Ron, fixer of all solutions, genius, came up with this idea of me sitting on a dolly for the scene when we're walking into um, the train depot. And, um, and it turned out, to be like so great, it worked out so well. And you know, I'm actually, I'm okay now. I actually did not need any surgery. So Bye. I'm very grateful that you know, things happened the way you did. What, what Ron did is we basically all lived together in this wonderful, uh, uh, you know, and I give a shout out to the Brody House. The Brody House. Brody House. Brody House. Which I think most people who shoot in Budapest uh, Hungary knows about it, but it's this wonderful, uh, amazing uh, boutique hotel that is essentially a huge frat house. You know? It felt like a kind of summer camp of everyone really building a rapport, you know, off screen that then I think really shines through on screen. And everyone is, it's just, it's so special to not only get to be with like an all Asian cast, but to have so many Asian people also behind the camera. Uh, it's just a different environment. Like the fact that there's hoisin sauce and sriracha on the table behind you right now, I'm like, this is my dream. <laughs> so we're basically all hanging out there, having dinners together, running lines, rehearsing things. People were doing self tapes all the time. It was. Wow, that, what, that sounds so actory. We did like fun stuff too. Uh, luckily everybody in the cast is great. Like, besides me, there's no like divas and like jerks. Like I'm, I've had to be uh, on my best behavior because everybody's so nice. And if you leave your laundry in the machine long enough, the director and producer will do them. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, RT. Mm. In the past 20 years of filming, I, I've never that actually lived together with directors and everyone and actually hear them snoring across the hall. Um, yeah, so it's been, it's been an amazing experience and, and uh, yeah, we got together, even though it's a, such a short time, but just because we are all together 24-7, you know, we got along so well and then I get to see their dedications and everything. This is a working service area, so you can only... Making a movie during COVID had some huge challenges, but it was also part of the cast and crew bonding. We had our family around us, and that made all the difference. 
A lot of us lived in the same hotel and we had family dinner around a big round table every night. I think all of us wouldn't change that experience for the world. What I'm seeing so far, I'm very excited and I'm sure that we will do honor to the original movie and the martial arts genre in general. Thanks for all your patience. It's a wrap. Yay! Thank you everyone, thank you.